Ouija board, commonly pronounced Ouija or Ouija. A Ouija board is a method of communication with a subconscious element, using a board or separate pieces of paper with all the letters of the alphabet, the numbers from 0 to 9, and the words yes and no written on it. There are other different types of boards, but this is typically the most common. Some people just use a board with yes and no written on it. Others have a board with lots of other commonly used words on it, as well as the basics. Whatever you use, these are generally all lumped together and collectively known as Ouija boards. People will tell you very scary stories about Ouija boards, of how someone they know became possessed and their head span round and vomited green slime everywhere, and how it predicted everyone would be murdered and by the morning they were all dead. There is one major flaw with this, and this is that these stories are generally rubbish and do not have a grain of truth in them whatsoever. Saying that, because of all the mythology associated with the Ouija board, it is dangerous to treat them lightly, as people can become obsessed with what happens, and so people of a nervous disposition or possibly suffering from mental health issues should stay clear of them. What you need to try out Ouija board experiments is a Ouija board and a planchette, but do not panic, as these items, in true Blue Peter style, can be made at home with washing up bottles and double-sided sticky tape, or more likely scrabble tiles and an upturned glass. The most common way to replicate a Ouija board is to take a large piece of paper, write all the letters of the alphabet in a circle, and then write the numbers 0 to 9 somewhere on the board, and near the middle write the words yes and no, making sure that in the actual middle of the board you leave a neutral space. Then take an upturned glass and place it onto the neutral space in the middle. All place your fingers lightly on the glass and start to ask questions. The glass will hopefully start to move and spell out the answers. That is the general idea of how it should work. In reality, what is more likely to happen is that the glass may move slightly, you will all accuse each other of moving it, and then total gibberish will be spelt until you find you're talking to the devil, Hitler, or the latest serial killer or victim who has died. This is one reason why, generally speaking, Ouija boards are not taken too seriously, but they can offer some interesting and fun results. I was once involved in a Ouija board session, and one person wrote down some information, that being the initials of someone she knew and their age when they died. There were five people holding the glass who then got both of these details correct without any form of deviation or misspelling. This does not, however, prove that we are talking to that dead person. We may somehow have experienced a mental link with the person writing down the information, and turned that into a movement of the glass and subconsciously pushed it to where we wanted it to go. One method of making a Ouija board, which I have found to be very effective, is by using Scrabble tiles. The smaller, travel rubber Scrabble tiles are best, placed in a circle, then write on some small scraps of paper the words yes and no, place a piece of glass over the top, I use the glass from a cheap clip frame, spread cooking oil over the sheet of glass, as this allows the pushed glass to move easier. Have one person, who is not pushing the glass, to sit with a pad and paper to write down the results, and film what is happening. The person writing down the results could well be the most important person in the room, as you will be amazed at how much you forget when you're holding the glass, and this person can quickly look up answers from ten minutes previous. Many reasons are offered up to why these boards do what they do, but the most common one that I have found is that the people holding the glass are subconsciously pushing it around the boards to spell out words. So if you believe in spirits, then there is no reason to think that these spirits couldn't communicate with us subconsciously and tell us where to push the glass. Problems. You may find people saying that if you rearrange the letters that you've come up with, then you find it spells a certain name or place but then anyone who watches Countdown will tell you that you can make many words from a handful of letters, so do not fall into this trap. You may find your answers affected by the beliefs and knowledge of the people in the room. I've found that the more religious a group is, then you're more likely to get demonic answers. The more boring a group of people, the more boring the response. The more hyperactive a group, the more outlandish the results. Ouija boards can be a lot of fun, but do treat them with respect, as we are dealing with forces unknown here. And by that, I do not mean necessarily ghosts and demons, but with the human mind. And you wouldn't start messing about with your mind if you didn't know what you were doing. 
I will conclude by saying that I have done a lot of Ouija boards, and whilst finding them slightly pointless, they can be fun and yield some interesting results. But the most important finding is that no one I have ever worked with has ever had a bad experience with them or knows anyone that has. Yet for some reason, we all seem to have a friend of a friend of a friend that became possessed after using one. Audio. There are various ways of capturing audio which basically break down into two groups, analogue and digital. Analogue generally describes things recorded onto magnetic tapes, like a normal tape recorder or video recorder, and digital really refers to the modern technology or mini disc recorder, MP3 and so on. There are certain experiments to try and capture EVP or electronic voice phenomena. They generally are conducted by either leaving a recording device in a room or venue and then listening back to see if there are any noises on it or by having the recording equipment there and asking questions of whatever entity you think may be around or conversing with you whilst leaving long enough gaps for it to be able to answer you. Analog, some people believe, is actually better for recording phenomena and there are great sections on the internet devoted to EVP. I have yet to hear any that would really convince me of this system working as most seem to have used filtering software to make it more audible or clear. The main issue we have with this is that this is how synthesizers work. If you take any sound and filter it and process it, you can make it sound like anything you want it to. So avoid the temptation to clean up sounds, leave them in the raw sense when producing them as evidence. Digital is the easier system to use as often it can be recorded onto memory cards or MP3 players which can then be instantly downloaded and then used again, allowing for hours of recording without breaking the bank when trying to pay for more and more tapes. Try to use a microphone that is on a stand that has some form of vibration protection, maybe place it on some foam to stop it recording noises that are actually vibrations through the floor or people kicking the microphone stand. You may find that a lot of EVP practitioners will tell you that the sounds need to be filtered or listened to by people with an ear that is used to hearing them. But when it comes to evidence, if you need to try and work out what it is that's being said, then it isn't clear enough to be used as evidence for anything. Therefore, good EVP is hard to find, but fantastic if you do. We recorded a few words being said in a pub that we are investigating, and because we had cameras in the room as well, we could go back and check that none of us made the noises we heard without resorting to ventriloquism, which I'm pretty sure none of us were capable of in that room. It's always a good idea, if you have equipment to spare, to have a recording going at all times, as you can use it to often cross-reference timings of events, and also because it might be that you get results on the tape that were not audible to the people present, or vice versa. Baseline readings. One of the most important things to do before you start getting spooked out at an investigation is to do the baseline tests. After acquiring a map of the area, make sure you have many photocopies of it. You will need several of these as each one will be used to record various different facts. Temperature. Ideally, you want a thermometer that can log data, one that can be left somewhere for five minutes and will tell you the top and bottom temperatures during that period of time. You need to find the normal temperature of the rooms you're going into, ideally the night before as well as the night you were investigating, and hope that weather conditions will be similar on both nights. When you have a room temperature, you need to go around the room looking for heat sources such as fires, heaters, light bulbs and so on. All of these need to be marked on the map so if your average room temperature is about 18 degrees, but when you walk across the room towards a window it drops, this needs to be marked on the map. Mark the time the temperature was taken, as well as the date on the map, as due to the fact that you can always check weather records for freak temperatures and conditions in that area. EMF there is a great deal of controversy over EMF meters and whether they actually do anything. For those of you who do not know what they are, they are devices that measure electromagnetic frequency. The reason that these may be important is that it is generally thought that ghosts give off a high level of electromagnetic fields or fluctuations. Now, as electrical devices give off varying levels of electromagnetic waves, a large amount of electrical appliances in that vicinity can ruin your results. Now it's generally assumed that anything over 10 milligauss is a high reading and could possibly harm your health, but also indicate a weird presence of paranormal activity. Now they often give false readings depending on which direction you point them in as well. 
For this reason, when doing your baseline test readings, you need to make a decision which direction to point the meter and keep it that way throughout the entire mapping process. When we do them, we use the four main compass points and take readings of the entire place. These are then marked on the map, indicating any area of high readings and noting electrical appliances that may be causing them, such as heaters and microwaves and so forth. Throughout the evening, you should make readings and note these as well. Keep the EMF meter to hand as hopefully, if something occurs, you can check whether any interesting phenomena corresponds to high readings. One very useful thing to note are any electrics that might be in the walls, as wiring can give off readings as well. Handheld metal detectors can be used for this purpose also. Drafts. A candle can be used to show if there are any drafts near windows and doors. We had a case where a woman thought that she had a presence in her house. This was often indicated by a breeze through the house that seemed to circle around her when she sat on a chair. We managed to work out that this was due to a faulty loft hatch. Noises. It's a good idea to indicate on the maps any noises that occur naturally. For example, if a room has a squeaky floorboard or the door has a faulty latch. These kind of things can prove invaluable and stop you wasting hours of time later on during the investigation. Dust. If the room has a large amount of dust or other materials such as cobwebs, note these down as it may affect the photos taken throughout the evening. This may seem trivial, but it will save you or the rest of your team a great deal of effort when it comes to photo analysis. We did an investigation in an area that had a lot of building material, and we seem to get a lot more photos of orbs here than anywhere else, obviously due to dust. Thermometers. There are several different types of thermometer available on the market, and it is a good idea to try and get as many types as you can, as they all function in varying ways. The traditional mercury thermometer. This is the type that everyone knows and is a good indicator of room temperature or surface temperature if placed on things like metal or stone. The good thing about this type of thermometer is that they are very cheap and you can actually see a physical response to temperature changing that digital and laser thermometers won't necessarily show you. Digital thermometers. We often use a thermometer that has two temperature gauges, one on the main body of the instrument and one on a long wire attached to it. This is so that you can use it indoors and place the wire outside the window to give indoor and outdoor temperatures. It's also very useful for measuring the temperature in two different parts of the same room. Laser thermometers. They come in varying levels of quality and can give very different results depending on their capability. The way they work is to fire at a surface like a wall and it bounces back the temperature to you. These are extremely useful when you need to know instant temperature readings at a place that is some distance from you. Please read their instructions and stats very carefully as they can vary in ability greatly normally depending on cost. Also the further away from an object the greater the area of temperature it is trying to read as the beam gets wider. Problems. The biggest problem you will find is that you may have two thermometers in the same place but are showing two different temperatures. This is often due to the fact they are not calibrated correctly. But do not let this be a problem, as any one instrument will be accurate with itself. And so, if one goes up by two degrees, then others should do as well. We had a very interesting case where three thermometers in the same place showed temperatures rising and falling between 7 and 21 degrees over a period of five minutes. They were all showing different temperatures even though placed next to each other. The important thing is that any one of these instruments showed a measurable phenomena, even though they differed from each other. The trigger objects. Trigger objects are the general term that encompasses the idea to try and get a ghost or spirit to physically move something. There are many types of trigger object experiment, and this can be one of the cheapest experiments to do, and one of the most spectacular if you get any response. The most common trigger experiment I have found is to place a coin on a plate and then lightly cover it with a thin layer of flour. This is done so that if anyone pushes the coin, the fingerprints will be visible, and also the coin moving will displace the flour and show you how far and what path it took. An even more simple experiment is to place an object onto a piece of paper and draw around it. If the item moves, then obviously the outline will no longer be around the object. If you have enough cameras to spare, then lock one off just focused on this.
Make sure the entire area is in frame, otherwise you cannot guarantee that it wasn't moved off screen. It can be a good idea if you can get permission from the building owner to draw around furniture with chalk, so if you do get the rare occurrence of furniture movement that will show up straight away. Some people think it is a good idea to use an item that in some way corresponds to the haunting. If it is generally presumed to be a small child that haunts a place, then use toys or try to find an object that dates from the time of the original ghost. Obviously, this is difficult, as you are second-guessing when the ghost once lived. We use a very interesting system for trigger objects. We use a poltergeist box. This was made using clear perspex. A box was made that could be placed over the experiment. This box is then alarmed, so that if it is lifted, the alarms go off. This means that it can be left in a room with no fear of anyone interfering with it. Make sure that once the item is placed, you photograph it from all angles, as when you return to the item, you may think that it has moved a few millimetres, and on examining the photo you realise this isn't so, and it's just a trick of lighting a few hours later. Problems The main problem you will face with this experiment is vibration. In old buildings, floorboards can cause something to move at the other end of a room, and so on your base tests, try and see if there are any natural vibrations in the room, maybe caused by traffic outside or people walking inside. Drafts may also cause you problems, as it could cause the flower or talc to be blown around, and make sure you use an item with a small amount of weight to it for the same reason. And obviously, objects like marbles are going to have their own problems if not on a completely flat, solid surface. Dowsing. For those of you who do not know what dowsing is, it is generally thought of as finding something using an artificial aid such as a pendulum or dowsing rod. Almost like a metal detector for other items, people or even emotions, and can be used to communicate to a conscious or a subconscious entity. Now a lot of people out there think of dowsers in a not particularly good way, as though we are delving into the realms of madness. So we have to start this by saying put all ideas and beliefs, good or bad, about dowsing to one side and see how dowsing can be a useful paranormal or ghost hunting tool. We are not in any way saying that dowsing definitely works and that you will all be finding oil in your back gardens next week, but like all experiments, if done correctly, will yield some measurable results and statistics are the easiest thing, as paranormal investigators, that we can truly offer the world of science. There are several types of dowsing and we will concentrate on a few here. Rod dowsing. No one can give you a perfect reason why dowsing works. Many will come up with various descriptions of geological energy sources and vibrations, but nothing has been proved to be 100% accurate. In fact, most of it hasn't been proved to be even close to 10% correct. So ignoring the issues of why it works, here is one method of how to do it. Take two bent rods. These can be bought dowsing rods from a shop or even a broken metal coat hanger bent into an L shape. The normal procedure is to have two of these dowsing rods held loosely in the hand with the longer part of the L shape pointing directly away from you. If you are dowsing some land looking for water, you then walk in a line and when the two metal rods cross, it is hoped that you are standing above water. Some people think it's a good idea to think of or even say out loud what it is you're looking for as this may help you find it. We have found dowsing is a useful tool to show that something interesting may be happening in a certain place. We have sent one dowser at a time, out of view of everyone else, to walk around an area and to mark on a map exactly where he gets any movement from the rods. This is then repeated with everyone in the group, and we then see if there are any correlations. This can often produce some very interesting results. There are several experiments that are very simple to produce with dowsing. Take an item such as a gold earring and place it in one of five identical mugs or plastic cups. Then take it in turns to try and find which cup it is in. This is something that can be done over and over again and has a statistical measurable element to it. Pendulum dowsing. Pendulum dowsing is more often used when dowsing on maps or when trying to communicate in some way with spirits. Anything can be used as a pendulum when dowsing. Some practitioners of this will tell you you need certain crystals and the pendulum must be a certain height or length depending on what you're looking for. I'm not here to tell you that these people are all talking rubbish as I cannot prove or disprove their belief, but what I have found is that there is a lot less to it than some practitioners lead you to believe. I have found through practice and experiment that anything with some form of weight and something to hang it from can work. 
So find yourself a weight. A small lead fishing weight is very good. If you wish to use crystals, lucky charms, something of personal or emotional value, it doesn't matter. Tie this to a chain or piece of string so that it hangs down. Then, holding it over certain areas of a map, you can douse much larger areas than if you were to try and walk around them. This method is often used for trying to find people or oil or anything on a large scale. Some people use the pendulum as the easiest method of communication between themselves and some other form of entity. Start by holding the pendulum so that it hangs and ask yourself some questions to which you know the answer must be yes, such as am I a man or do I have a beard and so on and so on. The pendulum will hopefully swing or rotate in a certain direction. This is likely to be your yes direction. Keep trying with different questions to be totally sure, then do the same with no questions. Once this is established, then you can ask any questions you wish to try and communicate with whatever you feel is there. Problems. There are obvious problems as soon as you start to do this. You will find that it is not accurate 100% of the time. Now if you're using this in experiments, be sure to note all the mistakes, as you cannot have true results without noting all the mistakes. You may also find that your mistakes, when shown over many experiments, actually show an interesting result that you weren't expecting, and that you all went wrong in the same place, and so on. The personal response form. The idea behind a personal response form is to give one to everybody in your group. Now, the reason for this is that they need to note down when and where exactly things happened. For example, if one person in that group got up, walked across and opened the door because they had to go to the toilet, they've got to mark down what time this happened so that anybody else in the building who heard some faint noise of floorboards creaking, for example, or doors opening, can correspond the time to the time somebody was walking around. This form is included on all the files and can be printed off as well.